Welcome back to DXB Today, where we are inspired by all things aviation today. Dubai Air Show ongoing at present. We're seeing the space programme here blossoming at the moment as well. And our next guest, no stranger to that. First female private astronaut, Namira Salim. Thanks so much indeed for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Very kind of you to join. I'm sure you were listening intently uh, to what we were discussing there with Anna and the rest of the team as well mm -hmm. about the potential of space. I know that's something that is very personal and close to you, the potential of space tourism. Um, what is the potential in your mind? Well, I think space tourism brings the dream of going to space to the common man. It makes it commercially viable and accessible to all markets or se all segments, including, you know, the educational governments, you name it. Like everybody has access to space during the commercialization of space, mm. which is the new space age that we are living in. And I mean, if you were to give it a time frame, there are those uh, that are lucky enough to get onto one of those flights at the moment to see space for the first opportunity. How, how, how long are we talking about before it becomes a lot more common? I think it would take maybe a couple of decades and maybe Anna is uh, better positioned to answer that question. At least a couple of decades. Yeah. I would Namira's say. like, yeah. I'm the adventurer. Man. Let's talk about because we're the supplier. Yeah. Um, I think it's what we're seeing is a flight cadence. So let's look at the flight cadence. So Virgin Galactic are flying monthly. Blue Origin will be flying monthly. So and the idea is that they'll ramp up in terms of um, building more spacecraft. And others will join the market. And others as well. will join the market. Yeah, yeah. And we see companies like Space Perspective and World of View that have high altitude balloons, mm -hmm. so not rockets as such, but they still have a space journey that people can that people can experience at a far lower cost as well. Yeah. Now, Namira, I want to talk about you because you just came back from space. Yes. Ah! <laughs> first of all, I have so many questions for you. Sure. The first thing I want to ask you about is, well, you have a lot of firsts. So can we go through your first? Because you have accomplished some. Uh, you know, in the last 10 years, what people hope to accomplish in one lifetime. To talk us through it, your first, some of your first. Well, it's kind of embarrassing, but yes, I was the first woman from here to go to the North and South Poles in 2007 and 2008. And then I skydived as the first woman from here in 2008 also. And I signed up for my space flight in 2006. I was the first person in this country to sign up for a commercial space flight and buy a ticket. And I waited 17 years, almost, wow. to go to space. Yeah. So it was a long journey, but a very rewarding journey because I learned a lot in the process. I mean, the training and actually going on the journey itself, was it everything you expected and would you do it again? I would definitely do it again. And I'm looking forward to doing it with other companies, like for example, intent. Blue Anna. Origin maybe. <laughs> um, yes, well, the training was uh, n not as hard as the first training, I would say. But the actual experience in the space shuttle was, I mean, in the spaceship was harder because we went through three and a half Gs mm -hmm. on the way up and on the way down. And on the way back, it was also like a bit of nausea in addition to the pressures. So I felt that, you know, my face was actually going to pull down all the way to my feet because <laughs> I had three and a half Gs on going from up to down. So that was pretty hard on the body, uh, more than what we had experienced in our training. Incredible. Now, Namira, you're actually an advocate for peace through space. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about your nonprofit. Yes, my nonprofit is called Space Trust, and I founded it because I had this beautiful journey in the process of going to space with Virgin Galactic. And I realized that in the new space age, because space becomes accessible to all, uh, you know, we need to make raise awareness for how governments and world leaders can understand that they will be able to go to space in no time and see that world from space, you know, beyond the political boundaries and mm -hmm. make the world more peaceful. So I'm an advocate in promoting space as the new frontier for peace through my nonprofit. And I've become known for space diplomacy as a thought leader in the industry. And it's just very rewarding because I think my next flight would probably be to promote this idea that space is indeed the place from where peace can be made on Earth. Mm. That's beautiful. There truly are no borders. Yes. yes. Beautiful. Anna. <clears throat> so obviously, Namira, you and I, we've been um, collaborating in, in the recent months because I think we share this vision that um, we should see more um, commercial space astronauts. What would you say to your younger self um, you know, knowing that you've just gone through this, what would you say to your younger self about this experience, like what you've been through? Because it, as you said, you signed up so many years ago, you've waited for almost 20 mm -hmm. years for this experience and now you've had it. What would you tell your younger self? I think there are many 
younger selves out there <laughs> who, who have you know looked up to my journey to space and they're inspired yeah. and uh, I come from a country Pakistan where there are 230 million people um, my journey has inspired them and I would tell my younger self or anybody who dreams of going to space that you know any dream is uh, accomplishable if mm -hmm. you believe in it if you stick to it if you're patient if you're focused and I think in this case it took a lot of patience and focus and the passion to dare and to dream and to believe that any dream can come true. It doesn't have to be a big dream or a small dream. Mm -hmm. As long as you have a dream, you need to stick to it and just go for it. Well, you're obviously an achiever, Namira, because we spoke about the poles, the sky diving, now of course uh, the commercial a move into space and a jewellery line as well. Yes, I mean, do you yes. ever rest or not? Uh, I do, but during the day, I'm a, I'm a stargazer, <laughs> so I work at night. Uh, that's really bad, but that's how I live. When does the jewellery line come out? Um, in a couple of months. It's an inspired by the night sky, by the constellations. And I did wear my pole star brooch to space because the mission patch actually showed the pole star and me as a little girl pointing to the North Pole, the North Pole and the pole star because that's what my father showed me when I was a little girl. Oh. And that's how I got hooked on to the stars. And the tribute I paid during my space flight was to my late father, so. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. So what's the next big goal, just before we let you go? Another space flight. <laughs> Do it! <laughs> Mind you, thank you for Don't so Don't wait 17 much. years though, okay? No, 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 not <laughs> this <laughs> time. <laughs> Nobody's thank getting so younger, <laughs> no. Namira, thank you so much for joining us. And also, best of luck on achieving all of your goals and of course your next uh, exploration into space. Now it is just two weeks before COP28 starts so we spoke to businesses and entrepreneurs to find out how it's created an impact on their businesses. How about we take a look? Hi my name is Kate Harcastle and I work in the UK, the UAE and the USA as a consumer insight specialist, what does that mean? I'm helping the brands you know and love to be better in terms of how they provide service and products to you around the world. I've done it for over 20 years and I also broadcast on the topic on many international channels. Secure My Scholarship is an edtech platform that connects students with scholarships and fee waivers at universities in Dubai and around the world. I've worked with Green Energy Solutions and Sustainability as CEO and leader of that company for the past 12 years. Holistified is the UAE's first dedicated booking platform and marketplace for wellness. So we're here to help you find your wellness in the UAE. We have the opportunity to make such a difference in sustainability and the businesses here really want that to happen. As someone who's been involved with COP over the years and particularly in sustainability, been working for over 20 years in that, I really want to make change and I believe people here are keen to do that too. So I think it provides a platform for our voices to be heard, to show a country that has grown so much, a country that depends on fossil fuels as its economy, to be able to embrace renewables and host a COP here is just something to be celebrated. It's so exciting that COP28 will be happening this year in Dubai. Now, one of the eight pillars of wellness for Holistified is sustainability. So it's a cause that's really close to our hearts and we really look forward to seeing more initiatives and events that are focused on leading a sustainable lifestyle. I think COP28 is gonna open a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs and startups here in the UAE. The eyes of the world will be on the UAE this year because of COP28. And I think mission-driven startups here in the UAE, not just in the edtech space, but in the climate tech, agro tech, health tech spaces across the entire spectrum will all gain spotlight and exposure because of COP28. So come on, let's work together. Let's make this happen. Oh, I'm excited about COP28, so much to look forward to. Thank you to all our experts there. Now it is time for the roundup. So Dot, what's the buzz in town? Well, I'll tell you what the buzz is. The buzz is our very own Emirates Airlines that operates its first flight from Dubai to Australia using sustainable aviation fluid. This promotes more sustainable flying and reduces carbon emissions. And I just think it's incredible that they've actually managed to do this for such a long journey and like yeah. such a long haul flight. What do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, also in, in, um, in rocketry, we're seeing uh, the use or the uptake of sustainable rocket fuels. So there's a company based in Scotland that's um, developing what we call Ecosine. Mm -hmm. So it's unrecyclable plastic that can be used as rocket fuel. So, yeah, I think it's a great sign that the industry is moving in, in the direction towards net zero. 
So sustainable aviation feels uh, currently the only alternate sustainable alternative, right? Why isn't it being used more often? Because it's what less than a percent right now? Um, well, I think that it's a technology. I think we're seeing the adoption, gradual adoption of certain technologies across the aerospace industry, both aviation and space. Um, but what we're seeing is in the space sector, we're seeing kind of um, like a, a leapfrog. So they're sort of jumping into these more sustainable end technologies and learning from the aviation sector. So there's some interesting parallels and lessons learned it's, on both sides. It's a difficult one, especially for the aviation world at the moment. And it's good to see that the, the research is going on at the moment and kudos to countries like Brazil who are taking it to a whole new level, etc. Not just from aviation, but um, and transport in general. But the, 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 it's the cost, it's the money. Um, and the expensive. research into sustainable aviation fuel and the actual production of sustainable aviation fuel is very cost intensive. And what do we want? We want to see our, our air prices and air tickets come down oh, in price. Especially yeah. now. So if you are a commercial <laughs> yeah. airline, yeah. how do you manage it? So absolute kudos and it's great to see Tim Clark talking about it readily at the air show this week as well saying, look, it's a long road. Yeah. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in this. We need to do it uh, because year of sustainability will end at the end of this year. But obviously our focus has to continue and our commitments to that as well. But um, yeah, there's some work to be done, that's for sure. In order, it's the mass production, isn't it? It's yeah. all good to do it on a smaller scale. Yeah. But the mass production is going to be the big challenge. Yeah. So for this flight specifically, they used 40% sustainable aviation fuel and then 60% regular rocket fuel. fuel. So they've yeah. merged, the bu merged the two so that the prices don't skyrocket. Mm. Um, so no, they're finding ways around it. Yeah. yeah. Very good. <laughs> Final words, <laughs> unintentional. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, it is uh, a debate that will continue to uh, run, but obviously not just in the aviation market, also in space and space tourism as well. Should we take a break? Let's take a break. After that break, we catch up with the youngest Emirati air traffic control officer in the UAE. And we're also going to try... Enough with the we, all right? OK? <laughs> One of us is going to try a workout with the team from Crank. The bikes are in the studio at the moment, uh, so don't go anywhere. <laughs> 